I have never been so excited to see a FedEx driver. But I'm gonna need more hands. Really never been any good at these unboxing videos. Ooh, wine voucher. Thanks, Summit. Why is it stuck? I was gonna say upside down. It's that too. Somewhere in here, there's a torque converter. Yeah, there it is. We're back here working on Mark 68 Coronet. It's day three of misery or whatever. And we've got a new torque converter to install finally. Now I don't have anywhere near enough time or enough knowledge to explain all the intricate differences between the different types of converters. But suffice to say, varying the design of the converter, the size of the converter and other variables can change your launch RPM. That's the RPM the engine will hang at when you hold the brake and gas revving the engine up. That one was rated for something like 3,600. That one's rated for something like 2,500. Now, the important thing to understand about those numbers is they're not precise. The actual flash speed is gonna vary by the torque input, which of course varies by the engine you've got in front of this converter. You can see the high stall is built out of a much smaller body. Generally, a smaller converter is gonna flash higher than a larger one. Not 100%. There are a lot of other variables inside that I don't have time to try and explain. This Coronet is basically a street car. It also doesn't have that aggressive of a camshaft. So this converter that was in it, unnecessary and ridiculous. This one, again with its 2500 RPM flash speed, should get up into the working range of the cam for acceptable launches and burnouts and stuff. But it won't be all sloppy and ridiculous. It should work really well on the street. This new converter is from TCI. Of course, so was the old one. Oh look! A distraction. As usual, I left the annoying parts involving much profanity off of camera, but I got the torque converter wrestled under here and in the transmission. Now I just need to reinstall the transmission and do all the things we did in the last video in reverse. That'll take me a while. We'll get back to this when it's like ready to fire again. It's some hours later and the sun is out. It's actually like warm outside. I'm not even wearing a flannel anymore. The transmission is loosely attached to the back of the 440 with two bolts. And I'm doing the flexi transmission dipstick tube delete. Unfortunately, the new one kind of hits everything. Uh, especially the cylinder head though. So I'm modifying its little hold down thingy that goes to one of the transmission bolts to see if I can somehow get it lined up. This may involve a hammer, uh, maybe a torch. I don't know yet, but it's not going well. I have like an hour into getting that hole to almost line up. This is not fun. That sucked. But it's in, and thankfully, no one will ever see the horrible butchery that was involved in making that happen. Here's my solution for the broken block ear. I could have cleaned that up better, but it was hot, and I was tired of holding it. Anyway, it's a bolt with an oversized washer with one flattened side, so it won't hit the starter. It'll sneak underneath there, and... As long as I can get that clocked right, it'll clamp the block in place. It'll do more than nothing, but honestly, it won't do a whole lot. I'll sleep better at night, though. The sun is setting in the sky. Cross members in, transmission jacks out. Now I just have to do everything else. Apologies, but you're definitely getting the broad strokes version of this operation. This is what, two minutes of footage for like five hours. So yeah, that's where we're at. Anyway, if you have any questions about how to put your torque flight transmission in, go watch the last video where I described disassembly and just play it in reverse. Oh, it's back together. <laughs> and I can finally get back to where I was like a week ago. Exactly a week ago, actually. Oh yeah, one further response to the people complaining about the Edelbrock under the hood. It's been a week. <laughs> And it starts like that. So, anyway. All right. Potato, 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 potato. I don't think you could possibly ever see this, but I've got the timing light on number one and I'm shining it through the hole to check the rotor phasing. The line is right in the middle. I'm gonna rev the engine up and see what happens there. It never changed. Neat. So usually I'm like against vacuum advance, but I actually think we might be going there on this one. And I might hook it up to manifold vacuum, just for science. 
because it sure seems like this thing wants a whole lot at idle. A whole lot more than I would normally think is acceptable. Now, Chris Birdsong did a video not too long ago about running vacuum vents on manifold and why. And that works for his combination. It's never worked for any of mine. But the interesting thing is this engine is pretty close to the kind of thing he builds. So maybe that's what it wants. I don't know, but we'll find out. Now I want to head this one off at the pass. I am not saying that just adding vacuum to your hot rodded V8 is going to magically make it run great. As we'll see later in the video, it worked on this engine, but that does not mean it will work on yours. Just keep that in mind. Burning all that residual horror off of the headers. So far, so good, except, oh yeah, I forgot it developed a new exciting coolant leak. And it's here, at this adapter for the coolant sensor for the Dakota Digital Dash. It didn't leak before. How could it possibly leak now? All right, well. I don't know why it didn't leak before. Well, I have one theory. I, I fixed another leak, so now there's pressure. That could be it. Okay, it wasn't loose. It was uh, <laughs> very tight. That would be our issue there. Only the finest. This is a pipe extender or adapter, probably because this dingus is kind of long, so you know it could bottom out in certain places. It actually doesn't in this housing, but that hex just starts to touch by the time it gets tight. I taped the crap out of it. I'm gonna snug it down and uh, hopefully that's all right for now, but it might need a new thingy later. It passes the squish test. Nice. All right, I tightened the ever living crap out of the alternator belt. And that worked. Sounded pretty good, huh? Now the headers are getting hot. This is 17 degrees base, 36 total. I'm still working on the math for that because I set it for 16, but anyway. Sounds pretty good now. I had to tweak the idle and the mixture just a little bit. And let it warm up, of course. That's not bad. Before I actually drive it, of course, we'll take off the dial a phasing cap with the holes in it and put the nice one back on. But how does it start? Good. Why are you squeaking again? Stop it. That's how nicely it starts with the vacuum advance. Of course, that advance isn't in play when it's cranking. As soon as it fires up, there it is. The occasional squeak. The accelerator pump is set on wussy mode. I should probably just kick it up a notch or two on general principle, huh? Well, it sure sounds good. Unfortunately, I dumped in all the transmission fluid I have and I'm still a little short. Or a lot short. And it's 8 p.m., which means the parts store is closed and I should be eating dinner right now. 
Ah, I gotta get this valve cover screw back in. Yay! All right, we'll revisit this in the morning. Hopefully figure out something. Ugh. Yeah, it's day four and what a fine day it is. Finally back on the ground. Why is that light freaking out? No idea. Anyway, time to dump in some more transmission fluid. This new dipstick with the Chevy style locking head is from All Star Performance. As mentioned earlier, um, not a perfect fit. Definitely an improvement over this horrible flexible thing, but uh, yeah, I had to grind the bolt here on that one, bend it slightly, dent it around the Edelbrock head, bend the whole tube. There aren't many other options available commercially, unfortunately. For science, here's a dead cold start with our current tune settings. Well, it sounds pretty good to me. You know, for the numbers on that cam card, this thing sure sounds rowdy. Only the finest of equipment. First test drive. Did I mention Mark's really tall? Still running the brakes on exclusively manifold vacuum. I don't think it's gonna be enough. Woo! Ah, it's a sensitive throttle. We like it. Yeah, it's a lot like that red charger. The brakes work once. Just not enough vacuum. Now this thing has a reservoir on it as well. And I wonder if just the reservoir would be enough at this point, or if we still need the electric pump. I got into it a bit out of my driveway. I didn't hear any pinging. That's what I'm listening for right now. We'll get this thing good and warmed up. Make sure it's happy and safe. decent day before it starts pouring rain for the next week. Welcome to Western Washington. Enjoy your stay. Okay, I went to 3,500 there and then just quit. Okay, there's 4,000. I just realized I really should have gotten a set of fresh plugs. Oh, and in case you're wondering why I'm not wearing a hat, I have a humongous sinus headache. It's great. <laughs> Area a ping in sight? Or hearing range or whatever. This thing is bananas. This is a great combination. We're definitely in the neighborhood. Runs pretty good. Hey, here we go. This is actually pretty helpful. Recall this plug was completely black before and now it's cleaning up. It would have been more ideal to start with fresh ones as I said, but this does tell me something. There's our timing line. That tells me currently we're safe and it probably could take a couple more degrees. We're really, really close here. Oh, and he sees. Now you'd have to go back to the first video in the series on this car to see what the plug looked like when we started. But take my word for it, it was all black. Super black means rich, bunches of fuel, right? Well, keep in mind here, I've made no changes to the fueling at all. Only to the distributor, you know, recurving and replacing it, and then reattaching a vacuum line to run the vacuum advance off of manifold vacuum. Mark was telling me that these headers get nice and toasty. And sure, you know, they're warm, but... The fact that they're coated makes a huge difference. I'm able to have my hand next to this and I'm fine. And that was after a bit of a spirited drive, as you saw. I learned in the first video that these Edelbrock heads have angled spark plugs. Man, this is a pain. I cannot get the angle right. I've been fighting this thing for like two minutes now. 
Ah, my hands cramping and the header's warm. For the moment, I'm gonna trust the timing line on the plug. So I gave it a little bump to 38 degrees. Now I do happen to know something about aluminum heads and that's that they tend to be very detonation resistant. So we're just gonna have to see here. I'm gonna be listening very carefully and monitoring what the engine is doing. If that breakup around 3,500 gets worse, I'm probably gonna back the timing back off, like real fast. And if not, we'll probably look at fueling. Well, it starts like this. So again, uh, we gotta be close. We really haven't gotten to actually look at this car, have we? Well, look at it. It's very green. Here are those sculpted lines on the quarter paddle of the 68 Coronet I was talking about in the first video. I just love all that character. I like the Charger more, but not by much. There's a lot more to this design than you initially think. Of course, the shape of the window and this filler, the ridge on the trunk, it's so sculpted. Yeah, it's not, but it's still pretty cool. Even plugging in the reservoir didn't do enough. It actually might have made it worse. I'm confused. Anyway, unrelated, I'm on the way to the bank to get money to pay for the next Dead Dodge Garage project, so. Good test drive for this thing. Ooh. I gotta come down here with a broom and sweep up all those rocks. Old person, the coronet does not speak 15 miles an hour. This thing is a shouty maniac. I love it. Oh, hey, remind me to check what the exhaust system is because this thing sounds amazing and I know people are gonna ask. They always do, and I never have any idea. Yeah, those are brakes. Once. Mm, yeah, I think we're gonna have to hook the pump back up. Forgot where I was going for a second there. I'm too excited. Tiny dog, where are you going? Yeah, this is pretty great, I gotta say. I'm gonna have a look at the vacuum reservoir. I'm gonna pull the number one plug again and see where the timing line ended up, how that's cleaning up. Uh, brakes that work consistently would be really nice. Now I think I mentioned these are actually pretty nice headers, but uh, do you hear that banging noise? Yeah, even though they beat them with a hammer over here on the driver's side, they still bounce off the torsion bar. Headers are the worst. Of course, I made the mistake of pulling up and idling for a minute. I like forgot who and where I was for a minute there. But here's what the plug looks like now. Much better. It's cleaning itself, which is great. Timing line, I'm not sure moved, but again, this might not be an accurate representation of full throttle, full timing. You know, I don't know. I'm not comfortable going further than 38 total right now. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. Nothing's melting and the engine sounds really happy. I'm getting pretty good at putting those angled plugs back in. That's the good news. We've got a 68 Coronet with a 440 under the hood that is running great. And all the fluids seem to be staying inside, so that's good. I hereby declare this coronet open. Oh yeah, the inevitable exhaust question. Two and a half inch welded mufflers. Those sure look like Flowmaster, but I can't see a maker's mark on them. Obviously it goes all the way out the back through some tips. Of course the headers are an important component as well. I think those are TTIs. Have I complained about them enough to tell you I don't think you should have headers? I think I have. Yeah, it's rained just enough for the road to be slimy. Time to take the Coronet for one more quick test run. I don't think we're going to have any problems, but, you know, we got to test it. Yeah, this isn't really ideal. It's not even real rain. It's just enough to get everything damp. This is a nice driving car. Of course, B-Body Mopars usually are. If you're looking for a nice driving experience in a classic, you can't go wrong with a B-Body. They're all great. This car, of course, has sway bars front and rear. I think they're firm feel. Whatever they are, they work. <laughs> it just corners so flat. This is great, I'm telling you. This is a driver's car. Another nice feature of this car, Mark got photos showing everything that's under this paint job. We know with 100% certainty it was never a rust bucket. 
competent is a good word for the handling in this car. It's great. Pretty today. And the wiper switch in this car actually works unlike mine. I'm quickly learning this car doesn't like old people. I was advised I would like the headlights. Never did get to test them at night though. It's just so green. Those tail lights are just awesome. I really like this. Well, I hope you enjoyed this one. I certainly did. We learned a lot, I think. I need to get this thing back to my place and undercover before it melts. And then it's going on a car trailer, so. Yay. Hey, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate that. You're helping me in my quest for global domination. One subscriber at a time. And remember, it ain't easy being green. Oh wait, I forgot. I was given explicit permission to do a burnout, so I better do that. Thanks, Mark. See you guys next time.